-hmm. All right. So let's start with this. Just remember, whatever we say, whatever content we produce in any platform is to be seen as informational, educational, and entertainment purpose only. Nothing that we say here is to be seen as financial tax or legal advice. Now, this Q&A occurs every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So feel free to join us at any time. It happens every week. You can also interact with us on Clubhouse Monday to Friday at 7 Eastern time. We may be moving out of Clubhouse into another platform. And of course, you can interact with us on YouTube, uh, Instagram, and X. I think this used to be a former Twitter logo, but it's X now. So the subject of today is submarine connections and i think a lot of people may see this as a surprise because we have this idea that everything is in the cloud no everything is pretty much underneath the sea so we're going to be talking about submarine connections we're going to be talking about what is a submarine cable what is the geopolitical impact of submarine cables the risks and security of those cables and how we may possibly address those risks so first of all what is a submarine cable well a submarine cable is a cable that is placed on the seabed between land-based stations to transmit telecommunication signals across the water. Pretty much is a way for us to get this equipment connected to other equipment via cable, but except that that cable now goes under across large bodies of water. It could be a sea, could be an ocean, could be lakes, and so on. Now, the submarine cable was first placed shortly after the introduction of the telegraph. The telegraph is the main propeller of this need for submarine cables. And the first one was to connect UK, England to France. And of course, after that, we had many more cables. The first undersea cable that was placed was this one to connect UK to France. And of course, that endeavor proved to be commercially successful. It proved to be very profitable and viable, financially speaking. And of course, once that happened, we had this whole engineering dedicated to how we can connect other places and how we can enhance and make communication faster. And that, of course, created a pretty good revolution on the way we communicate. And we had cables going across the Atlantic. You can see here on the map, this is a view of submarine cables and the dotted lines across the Pacific indicate planned cables laid in 1902 to 1903. You can see here humans even thought, okay, we can also cross the Pacific Ocean. Now, back then, of course, it was used mainly for telegraph. But of course, today we have much more going on with those cables. And here are the cables of today. It's a visual map on, we can see there's a lot of cables, a lot of density here on the South Sea of China. We're going to be talking more about the relevance of this area and what has happened in this area further in this presentation. So in the past, those cables were very fragile, and they were protected by hemp and Indian rubber. So you can see here how the layers were. And of course, the fact that they were protected with hemp today, if they were still protected by hemp, that would be causing a dispute and a problem for us. But the thing is, they change. You can see here today, they're made of fiber optics. They're much thinner in comparison to the other cables. Now, some fun facts. There is over 485 cables in operation. And they're responsible for 95% of all international data traffic. Now, I know a lot of people think, oh, we, our communication is made by satellites. All the satellites know most of our communication. If you are watching this now on YouTube, or if you're watching this live, or if you're here with me on Zoom, most of the communication is happening via one of those cables. Very little goes via satellite. So less than 5% of the communication goes to the satellite. And of course, the satellites have a problem with a latency, which cables do not have. Now, cables are much cheaper to install. They're much easier to maintain, and they transfer data much faster. So they're far more reliable, and they're far more easy to maintain and install than satellites, for instance. Now, submarine cables were created in a time where the planet was at peace, and they were not seen as a geopolitical asset, because just like now, most people do not know about them. So the thing is, ever since we start using cables, the world has changed. So has changed the nature of what we use those cables for, right? So the goal was in the beginning to facilitate a more efficient communication service. That was the idea, was mainly with the telegraph. Today, we are far more relying on those cables for much more than just telegraph communication. So those structures they were not intended at the time to be ongoing maintenance or surveillance. And today we have the need for surveillance on those cables because 
this is the grid on what it looks like today. And because of geopolitical events, we need to figure a way to secure those cables. So the internet has increased the importance of those cables. And today, they're pretty much one of the bedrocks of the foundation of our global economy. Our global economy would not work if those cables are not functional, which makes them vulnerable to conflicts such as war. So that is exactly what I'm going to be talking now in the second part of this presentation, which is how does this grid of cables, this heavy dependence on cables, impact our geopolitical world or our planet in geopolitical terms? So the thing is, those submarine cables today, they are vital for our lives. We have become cyborgs. And if you don't think you're a cyborg, try to be without your phone for two days and you see that you're a cyborg. And if you still don't believe you're a cyborg, try to interact with your government without an email. And there's a lot of things you cannot do today unless you have a cyborg or an extension of yourself as a computing device, which is your phone. You cannot interact financially. You most likely will not be able to interact with your family and you will not be able to interact with anything unless you have an extension of you that is a robot or a computer. So, and of course, 95% of everything that happens here goes through those cables. Now, we have financial transactions and global communication and international scientific cooperation all going through those cables. Those cables become an essential part of our lives. It connects us to the globe, it connects the globe and the financial world, the news world, whatever interaction we do today is going through those cables. So they're also vital for computing power and artificial intelligence. And here to have an idea of how important those cables are, each day, each 24 hours, those cables are responsible for 10 trillion US dollars in transactions. Three zero is a thousand, six zero is a million, nine is a billion, 12 is a trillion. So this is just the financial amounts that are transacted each 24 hours on those cables. I'm not talking about like more sensitive data that we rely on those cables. So now the question is, how can we secure this infrastructure that is crucial to our lives? So there's a lot of talks on how can we secure, how can we prevent attacks to happen to this system? And I'm going to use an example of an attack that occurred on a cable and what the consequences were. And that was just like a sample in a small attack. So besides financial transactions, you also have a lot of sensitive data going through those cables. There's spies, there's intelligence, there's a lot more data going through those cables than we can possibly think of. So they became vital to our lives. And here's the moment where I want to share with you a small attack. In February 2023, Chinese vessels cut an undersea cable on the Matsu Island of Taiwan. Now, in my view, that was the first attack of China on Taiwan. I personally, and this is my opinion, it has not been verified. This is my personal opinion. I believe this was a deliberate attack. And I think it was a demonstration, a way for China to demonstrate to Taiwan what can be done. And the reason why I believe this was deliberate is because of what happens after the, the cutting of those cables. So all the companies in Taiwan, airports, hotels, restaurants, stores, they were unable to access their systems. So pretty much it destroyed that portion of Taiwan completely in terms of economic activity. Booking of hotels, the whole infrastructure of that region collapsed. Now, also what had happened is the residents had a very limited internet access. They had to go back to the radio and that lasts for about 50 days where they were relying on radio to do their connection and to have internet. And of course, radio internet is much slower than fiber optic cable. Another thing that happened is the Taiwanese authorities, they arrange to get a repair vessel. Now, there are not many of those vessels that can come and give maintenance and repair those cables, but somehow, coincidentally, the China Navy had to, they were conducting a military exercise precisely on that location and precisely around those dates. Now, as you may know, military exercises are not done overnight. They have scheduled. So that's why I believe it is too much coincidence. I do believe that China was trying to set a message. So when the ship came to repair the cable, of course, with the military exercise, the Navy exercise, the ship could not repair the cables for Taiwan. So today we have about 500 cables, however, only 60 ships that are capable to come, install and repair an installation of those cables. So there's a scarcity on those ships that can make the installation and provide maintenance for those cables. Now, there is today a very unstable world. And in my view, 
Yes, you can throw nuclear bombs, you can throw soldiers, but cutting those cables can very heavily undermine and destroy any capacity of your enemy to respond. The communications of the enemy would be, of course, damaged by cutting those cables. I think China attack on the Taiwanese cable is an example. If you guys haven't seen that, there's a video, I think, on YouTube. It's about 15 to 20 minutes where it talks about how impactful damaging those cables were to Taiwan. So the world is very unstable. We're having conflicts. And I see the possibility of we are ready to be on what I call the World War Three or the Third World War. The U.S. already sends soldiers to Israel. And even though there are no soldiers from all the countries, there are many countries involved in the conflict in Ukraine. They're sending gear instead of soldiers. But in the case of Israel, for instance, the U.S. already sent their own troops and their own soldiers to do something and to prepare for a conflict. We also have submarines and military presence on Asia, close to the Korean Peninsula. So I see as the world becomes more unstable and more conflicts, I think it will be very easy for one of those countries just to cut connections on those cables and kind of damage the possibility of their enemies to communicate and counterattack. So... Now, the problem with attacking those cables is that 99% of those cables are owned by private companies. So for anyone who thinks government is the one that provides us the greatest technology and everything else, just be aware that 99% of those cables are owned by private companies. And of course, private companies, they do not have the same power as government to mobilize armies to come and put soldiers to defend and protect the integrity of those cables. So now the issue is how to finance an undersea cable security, right? Because the technological companies, they continue to finance the laying out of those cables and expansion of this grid of cables. But there's an issue of security. I think eventually there will be private companies, uh, private armies that will be hired to secure those cables. Now, those cables are owned mainly by four companies or four countries. We have Alcatel, we have NEC, we have Huawei submarine, which is Chinese, and you have Subcom, which is American. So we have France, US, Japan, and China as most owners of these cables. What I find incredible to see is that one is American, another one is in Europe, but this is Asia, Japan, and China. So the Chinese network controls 10% of all submarine cables on the internet. So that's how much they hold right now. And of course, as more companies invest, that may change, but today, Amazon. Meta, Google, and Microsoft are changing that. They are becoming the largest owners of those submarine cables, and they're constructing their own submarine grid themselves. I haven't seen any company yet looking for private security for those cables. I think they're living in a world where they believe the cutting or seeing those cables as a target is not there yet. I would say I'll pay more attention to what China did to Taiwan, and I'll start to see those cables as vulnerabilities to be protected. So a little recap, today we talk about what a submarine cable, we talk about the geopolitical impact of it, we also talk about companies that own those cables and how those cables may be a point of vulnerability for us to look at, and I think is being overlooked by many authorities in the globe. So there's going to be a part two for this presentation where we're going to be talking about more in deep about the geopolitical impact. We're going to be talking about the risks to the security of these cables and what I think is the best way to address the security problems or the security issue of these cables. This is it for this presentation. If you want to be in more control of your financial world and your money, please consider joining us in the Academy. There's going to be a link on below the description of this video where you can just contact us. And if you did like this kind of content, please like, subscribe, click the notification bell. Also share this with someone who you believe may benefit from this.